Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we are diving into the world of self-hosted zero-tier networks. We'll be building our own private root servers and private controller, giving you complete control over your network. This is perfect for anyone who wants increased security, privacy and customization with their own zero-tier setup. Whether you're a home user or business owner, this video will equip you with the knowledge to build your own private network. So buckle up and get ready to learn how to set your own private root servers and controller for zero tier. By the end of this video, you'll have a secure and private network ready to go. In our last video, we explored how zero tier works. Remember, it lets your devices connect without needing any client setup. How? Each zero-tier client has a built-in connection to root servers scattered worldwide, managed by zero-tier itself. Think of these servers as a giant address book, knowing where every device is. Now, when two devices want to communicate, they want to connect directly. But initially, they don't know each other's IP addresses. That's where the root server steps in. The requesting device sends a message to the nearest root server, which then forwards it to the target device. Clever, right? On top of that, the root server sends a special rendezvous message to both devices. This message contains hints how they can talk directly, bypassing the middleman, the root server. If the devices succeed with UDP hole punching, they establish a direct connection for faster communication. But if not, the root server continues to rely messages, though it's a bit slower. What if the devices do not have internet access? Or UDP traffic is completely blocked on the firewall? Or we don't want to rely on external servers? Will the node still be able to communicate? Let's find out. Here's our lab setup. We have two internal networks, 192.168.10/24 and 192.168.12/24. In the first network we have node 1 and node 2. On the second network we have node 4 and node 5. Additionally, node 1 has a second interface so it's connected to both networks. I will go to one of the nodes, let's say node 4 and switch to the folder with zero tier configuration, that's var lib zero tier one. At the moment, the configuration folder is empty. Once I start zero tier client, it will generate necessary configuration file. We'll find the authentication token to locally hosted controller, folder with controller configuration, public and private keys used to join zero tier network, file containing metrics in Prometheus format along with the token, configuration for the root servers, as well as file with PID and port of the process. Let's check device address and connection status. Here's the generated address that's 10 hex digits long. It's created upon start. Here are the public and private keys stored inside identity files. Mind that if you stop zero tier service, remove the configuration files and start it again, it will generate a new 10 digit address. Looking back at the connection information, we see the status is offline. What does it mean? Zero tier client is unable to reach any of its root servers, hence it's unable to register itself in the network. If we look at the firewall configuration, we'll discover that outgoing traffic is only allowed to 192.168 network to zero tier interface and to loopback interface. I did block all other traffic on purpose to simulate an air gapped network without internet access. In fact, all four nodes can reach each other but don't have internet access. Zero tier status on every node shows offline. Luckily, there is a way to host your own root servers called moons. It's possible to set up a private root server in a few simple steps. I will choose node 1 to be the moon as it has connectivity to both 10 24 and 12 24 networks. 
few things to consider. The root server needs a static IP. Moreover, your nodes need to have connectivity to the moon. It's also recommended that Moon does not share any other functions like being a controller or join network as a member. You can have multiple Moons in your network. Getting back to the setup. First, let's go to the configuration folder. Now we need to generate so-called world definition file with the zero tier ID tool command. This command is used to manipulate identities. With the init moon option and the public key, it will generate a world definition file. Let's open it up and define our static endpoints. Those are the IP addresses and ports our moon server will listen on. We need to put our interface IPs there. I will put both 10.230 IP and default port 9993 UDP as well as 12.230 IP and the same port. It's important for the nodes to be able to reach those IPs and ports. Next, let's generate a so-called signed moon file based on our world definition. Private key from your full identity file will cryptographically sign the world definition file. This signature file verifies the authenticity and integrity of the moon configuration. Here we go. There's the signed moon file. Last step is to create a moon.d folder that will hold our signed moon files. Then let's move our moon file there and change the owner to zero tier. Let's restart our zero tier service. If we look at our node status, we'll see that now it's online. The list moon option will show moon's configuration. Indeed, our private root server is operational. Here are the endpoints is listening on. That completes our private root server creation. Next step is to tell other nodes to use that moon server. Let's go to node 4 and switch to the configuration folder. I will create the moons.d folder and then copy the moon definition from node 1 to the moons.d folder on node 4. OK, it's there. Let's change the owner of the folder to zero tier and restart our zero tier service. See what happened? Our node is now operational. If we look at the result of the Pierce command, we discover a direct connection to the moon server. Our node did register with the private root server. If I go back to the moon and issue the same command, there's the direct connection to the node, but here the role is leaf. Let me quickly repeat the same steps on node 2. That is, create the moons.d directory, copy the configuration from node 1, and reload the service. Also, let's do the same on node 5. If we list the peers on the moon, we can see all three nodes are in service. Node 2, node 4, and node 5. Mind that the moon holds the directory of all connected nodes. Another thing to mention is that the moons and nodes are directly connected. Here's the IP and port of the remote endpoint. If you wonder why the port is not 9993 UDP, that's because the zero tier client is listening on three ports and can use any of them. Let's go to node two and execute the info command with dash J option. It will give us more information. Here are all three ports our application is listening on. Here are the surface addresses. At the moment, they are the same as our private addresses, but if you had access to the internet, you'd see your public addresses there. Just to sum up, we had four servers with no internet access, but connectivity with each other. To build a zero tier network on one of the servers, we initialized a world definition, updated the definition with node static IPs, signed the file and restarted the zero tier service, making the node a private root server, aka moon. Then we loaded the signed file on all members and restarted the service on each of them. The node is now a dedicated private root server. All other nodes connect to that node. A configuration is hard-coded into the signed world definition file. Few things to keep in mind. You should have at least two moon servers. Single moon server deployment is risky. If it goes down, your zero-tier network goes down. 
Uh, collocating other services on the Moon server is not recommended for security and performance reasons. Finally, nodes should have network access to the Moon server. Root servers are responsible for low-level connectivity, peer discovery and encryption. To build a zero-tier network, we'll need a zero-tier controller. It's responsible for admitting members to the network, issuing certificates and issuing default configuration information. Because we don't have internet access, we cannot use the globally hosted zero-tier controllers. Luckily, every node has a controller built in. It's a RESTful interface available on port 9993 TCP on the loopback. Let's go to one of the nodes, let's say node 5, and interact with local controller via command line like this. Let's try the REST API with CURL. We got an error as it requires authentication. Let's obtain the token and then enter it in the header out field like this. Do you see that? We got identical output, but by using the REST API. You could create a network, uh, set up IPs and admit nodes just by using CURL, although it would be a bit cumbersome. There is a zero tier network controller user interface available under GPL license. Mind that the GUI will install only talks to your local controller via REST. It's not a controller itself, only a GUI. Hope that's clear. Let's begin the setup by installing a few prerequisites. For that, we'll need internet access. I will stop the zero tier service and also stop the firewall. First, we'll need to install Git and build essential packages. Build essentials are software tools needed for compiling software from source code on Debian-based systems. As the application is written in JavaScript, we'll need the Next.js runtime environment to run it. Let's add the repository with Node version 18, then install the Node.js runtime. Now, let's check if it's working. Yep, Node 18 is there. I will update npm that's Node's package manager to the latest version, as well as install Node uh, GYP to support native add-ons. I will also add the PM2 process manager that we'll need later to manage our application. Finally, let's clone the repository with the application. Then go to the folder with sources and install all required modules. Let's also create an initial password file. It holds the default username and password to the controller GUI. This application can read its configuration from environment variables. We can also place the configuration in the .env file. Application will read those configuration variables as if they were environment variables. First, let's set the authentication token that the application will use to communicate with the local controller. We'll read it from the auth token file. Then, let's set the environment to production. Finally, I will set the application to listen on all interfaces. By default, it only listens on the loopback. I will change the permission to the configuration file so that only the owner can read it. OK, our application is ready. Let's start the firewall and start the zero tier one service. Finally, let's start our GUI with npm start. I will open browser and point to the GUI on port 3000 TCP. The default user is admin and default password is password. Let's set a new password. You could also create a new user, uh, re-login and delete admin user. I will create a new network by going to the networks tab and selecting add network. I will name it my net. Then let me create a new route. We need one that will cover our subnet. Here's the network identifier that other nodes should use to join this network. Mind that the first 10 characters of the network identifier is the zero tier address of the node. The remaining six characters are the network number. Okay, let's go to node two and try joining the network. I will click refresh. Okay, we got the joining request. Let's name it node two and tick authorize. Then let's assign an IP address by selecting IP assignment and put an IP from the range we defined earlier. If we look at node two, we'll see it join the network. 
Also, a new interface has been created and an IP address has been assigned. Controller is on our peer list. Let's join the network from the second node. I will click Refresh. OK, we got the joining request. Let's name it node 4 and tick Authorize. Let's also assign an IP address by selecting IP assignment and put an IP address from the range we defined earlier. OK, our node joined the network and has an IP assigned. Let's test our setup. I will try pinging node 4 from node 2. Works. Mind that a new direct connection has been established between node 4 and node 2. Remember, the GUI is just an interface that talks to the controller. I can stop the GUI and everything will keep working. The controller is up and running as it's part of the zero tier service. Network and member configuration are stored as flat files in the controller.d folder. There is one more thing I'd like to show you. Currently, node 2 and node 4 have direct connection. Our private root server told them about each other. What if there was no direct connection between node 2 and node 4? Let's uh, simulate that. I will stop the zero tier service on node 2, then block the direct connection to node 4. Uh, let's do the same on node 4. Stop zero tier service, block the connection to node 2. Finally, let's start zero tier service on node 4 and start zero tier service on node 2. Let's check if the connection still works. I will ping node 4 IP from node 2. Works. The connection is relied via the moon server that has access to both node 2 and node 4. If you'd like for your controller to start at boot, you can achieve that with the PM2 process manager. First, you just issue the PM2 start command and provide the application code. Then you set the name. This should start your Node.js application. Let's double check if it's running with the PM2 status command. All looks good. Let's issue the PM2 startup command that will auto-generate system startup scripts. With PM2 save, we can store a list of the applications currently managed by PM2, so they start at boot. In a real life scenario, your Node.js application should only listen on localhost, and there should be a reverse proxy with SSL in front of it. Moreover, this application is a perfect candidate for Docker containerization. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more interesting networking content.